Number 252, Rue Monsieur Le Prince, by Ralph Adams Cram. When in May 1886 I found myself at last in Paris, I naturally determined to throw myself on the charity of an old chum of mine, Eugene Marie Dardèche, who had forsaken Boston a year or more ago on receiving word of the death of an aunt who had left him such property as she possessed. I fancy this windfall surprised him not a little, for the relations between the aunt and nephew had never been cordial, judging from Eugene's remarks touching the lady, who was, it seems, a more or less wicked and witch-like old person, with a penchant for black magic, at least such was the common report. Why she should leave all her property to Dardesh, no one could tell, unless it was that she felt his rather hobbledy-hoy tendencies toward Buddhism and occultism, might someday lead him to her own unhallowed height of questionable illumination. To be sure, Dardesh reviled her as a bad old woman, being himself in that state of enthusiastic exultation which sometimes accompanies a boyish fancy for occultism. But in spite of his distant and repellent attitude, Mademoiselle Bly de Tartas made him her sole heir, to the violent wrath of a questionable old party known to infamy as the Tsar Torrevieja, the King of the Sorcerers. This malevolent old portent, whose grey and crafty face was often seen in the Rue Monsieur Le Prince during the life of Mademoiselle Tartas, had, it seems, fully expected to enjoy her small wealth after her death, and when it appeared that she had left him only the contents of the gloomy old house in the Quartier Latin, giving the house itself and all else of which she died possessed to her nephew in America, the Tsar proceeded to remove everything from the place and then to curse it elaborately and comprehensively, together with all those who should ever dwell therein, whereupon he disappeared. This final episode was the last word I received from Eugene, but I knew the number of the house, 252 Rue Monsieur Le Prince. So, after a day or two given to a first cursory survey of Paris, I started across the Seine to find Eugene and compel him to do the honors of the city. Everyone who knows the Latin Quarter knows the Rue Monsieur Le Prince, running up the hill towards the Garden of the Luxembourg. It is full of queer houses and odd corners, or was in 86, and certainly number 252 was when I found it quite as queer as any. It was nothing but a doorway, a black arch of old stone between and under two new houses painted yellow. The effect of this bit of 17th century masonry with its dirty old doors and rusty broken lanterns sticking gaunt and grim out over the narrow sidewalk was, in its frame of fresh plaster, sinister in the extreme. I wondered if I had made a mistake in the number. It was quite evident that no one lived behind those cobwebs. I went into the doorway of one of the new hotels and interviewed the concierge. No, Monsieur Dardesh did not live there, though to be sure he owned the mansion. He himself resided in Muden, in the country house of the late Mademoiselle de Tartas. Would Monsieur like the number and the street? Monsieur would like them extremely, so I took the card that the concierge wrote for me, and forthwith started for the river, in order that I might take a steamboat for Muden. By one of those coincidences which happen so often being quite inexplicable, I had not gone twenty paces down the street before I ran directly into the arms of Eugène Dardèche. In three minutes we were sitting in the queer little garden of the Chien Bleu, drinking vermouth and absinthe, and talking it all over. "'You do not live in your aunt's house,' I said at last, interrogatively. "'No, but if this sort of thing keeps on, I shall have to. I like Muden much better, and the house is perfect, all furnished, and nothing in it newer than the last century. You must come out with me tonight and see it. I have a jolly good room fixed up for my Buddha. But there is something wrong with this house opposite.' I can't keep a tenant in it, not four days. I have had three, all within six months. But the stories have gone around, and a man would as soon think of hiring the Cur de Camp to live in number 252. It is notorious. The fact is, it is haunted in the worst way. I laughed and ordered more vermouth. That is all right. It is haunted all the same, or enough to keep it empty. And the funny part is that no one knows how it is haunted. Nothing is ever seen, nothing heard. As far as I can find out, people just have the horrors there, and have them so bad they have to go to the hospital afterwards. I have one ex-tenant in the Bisset now. So the house stands empty, and as it covers considerable ground and is taxed for a lot, I don't know what to do about it. 
I think I'll either give it to that child of sin, Toravieya, or else go and live in it myself. I shouldn't mind the ghosts, I am sure. Did you ever stay there? No, but I have always intended to. And in fact, I came up here today to see a couple of Rakel fellows I know, Farjo and Dushan, doctors in the clinical hospital beyond here, up by the Parc Montsouris. They promised they would spend the night with me sometime in my aunt's house, which is called around here, you must know, La Bouche d'Enfer, and I thought perhaps they would make it this week if they can get off duty. Come up with me while I see them, and then we can go across the river to Vefours and have some luncheon, or you can get your things at the Chatham and we will go out to Muden, where, of course, you will spend the night with me. The plan suited me perfectly. So we went up to the hospital, found Fargeau, who declared that he and Duchesne were ready for anything, the nearer the real bouche d'enfer the better, that the following Thursday they would both be off duty for the night, and that on that day they would join in an attempt to outwit the devil and clear up the mystery of number 252. "'Does Monsieur l'Americain go with us?' asked Fargeau. "'Why, of course,' I replied. "'I intend to go, and you must not refuse me, Dardesh. I decline to be put off.' Here is a chance for you to do the honors of your city in a manner which is faultless. Show me a real live ghost, and I will forgive Paris for having lost the Jardin Mobile. So it was settled. Later we went down to Muden and ate dinner in the terrace room of the villa, which was all that Ardèche had said and more, so utterly was its atmosphere that of the 17th century. At dinner Eugene told me more about his late aunt and the queer goings-on in the old house. Mademoiselle Bly lived, it seems, all alone, except for one female servant of her own age, a severe, taciturn creature with massive Breton features and a Breton tongue whenever she vouchsafed to use it. No one ever was seen to enter the door of number 252 except Jean, the servant, and the Sar Torrevieja, the latter coming constantly from none knew whither, and always entering, never leaving. Indeed, the neighbors who for eleven years had watched the old sorcerer sidle crabwise up to the bell almost every day declared vociferously that never had he been seen to leave the house. Once, when they decided to keep absolute guard, the watcher, none other than Maitre Garceau of the Chien Bleu, after keeping his eyes fixed on the door from ten o'clock one morning when the Tsar arrived until four in the afternoon, during which time the door was unopened, he knew this, for had he not gummed a ten centime stamp over the joint and was not the stamp unbroken, nearly fell down when the sinister figure of Torieva slid wickedly by him with a dry pardon, monsieur, and disappeared again through the black doorway. This was curious, for number 252 was entirely surrounded by houses, its only windows opening on a courtyard into which no eye could look from the hotels of the Rue Monsieur le Prince and the Rue de l'Ecole and the mystery was one of the choice possessions of the Latin Quarter. Once a year the austerity of the place was broken, and the denizens of the whole quarter stood open-mouthed watching many carriages drive up to number 252, many of them private, not a few with crests on the door panels, from all of them descending veiled female figures and men with coat collars turned up. Then followed curious sounds of music from within, and those whose houses joined the blank walls of number 252 became for the moment popular, for by placing the ear against the wall strange music could distinctly be heard, and the sound of monotonous chanting voices now and then. By dawn the last guest would have departed, and for another year the hotel of Mademoiselle de Tartas was ominously silent. Eugene declared that he believed it was a celebration of Walpurgis Knot, and certainly appearances favored such a fancy. A queer thing about the whole affair is, he said, the fact that everyone in the streets swears that about a month ago, while I was out in Concarneau for a visit, just as when my revered aunt was in the flesh, the house was perfectly empty, as I tell you, so it is quite possible that the good people were enjoying a hallucination. I must acknowledge that these stories did not reassure me, in fact, as Thursday came near, I began to regret a little my determination to spend the night in the house. I was too vain to back down, however, and the perfect coolness of the two doctors who ran down Tuesday to Muden to make a few arrangements caused me to swear that I would die of fright before I would flinch. I suppose that I believed more or less in ghosts. I am sure, now that I am older, I believe in them. There are, in fact, few things I cannot believe. Two or three inexplicable things had happened to me, 
and although this was before my adventure with Rendell and Peastum, I had a strong predisposition to believe some things that I could not explain, wherein I was out of sympathy with the age. Well, to come to the memorable night of the 12th of June, we had made our preparations, and after depositing a big bag inside the doors of number 252, went across to the Chien Bleu, where Fargeau and Duchesne turned up promptly, and we sat down to the best dinner Père Garceau could create. I remember I hardly felt that the conversation was in good taste. It began with various stories of Indian fakirs and oriental jugglery, matters in which Eugene was curiously well-read, swerved to the horrors of the great Sepoy mutiny, and thus to reminiscences of the dissecting room. By this time we had drunk more or less, and Duchesne launched into a photographic and Zola-esque account of the only time, as he said, when he was possessed by the panic of fear. Namely, one night many years ago when he was locked by accident into the dissecting room of the Lucine, together with several cadavers of a rather unpleasant nature. I ventured to protest mildly against the choice of subjects, the result being a perfect carnival of horrors, so that when we finally drank our last creme de cacao and started for La Bouche d'Enfer, my nerves were in a somewhat rocky condition. It was just ten o'clock when we came into the street. A hot, dead wind drifted in great puffs through the city, and ragged masses of vapor swept the purple sky. An unsavory night altogether, one of those nights of hopeless lassitude when one feels, if one is at home, like doing nothing but drink mint juleps and smoke cigarettes. Eugene opened the creaking door and tried to light one of the lanterns, but the gusty wind blew out every match, and we finally had to close the outer doors before we could get a light. At last we had all the lanterns going, and I began to look around curiously. We were in a long, vaulted passage, partly carriageway, partly footpath, perfectly bare but for the street refuse which had drifted in with the eddying winds. Beyond lay the courtyard, a curious place rendered more curious still by the fitful moonlight and the flashing of four dark lanterns. The place had evidently been once a most noble palace. Opposite rose the oldest portion, a three-story wall of the time of Francis I, with a great wisteria vine covering half. The wings on either side were more modern, 17th century, and ugly, while towards the street was nothing but a flat, unbroken wall. The great bare court littered with bits of paper blown in by the wind, fragments of packing cases and straw, mysterious with flashing lights and flaunting shadows while low masses of torn vapor drifted overhead, hiding, then revealing the stars, and all in absolute silence. Not even the sounds of the streets entering this prison-like place was weird and uncanny in the extreme. I must confess that I already began to feel a slight disposition towards the horrors, but with that curious inconsequence which so often happens in the case of those who are deliberately growing scared, I could think of nothing more reassuring than those delicious verses of Lewis Carroll's. Just the place for a snark, I have said it twice, that alone should encourage the crew. Just the place for a snark, I have said it thrice, what I tell you three times is true. Which kept repeating themselves over and over in my brain with feverish insistence. Even the medical students had stopped their chaffing and were studying the surroundings gravely. One thing is certain, said Fargeau, anything might have happened here without the slightest chance of discovery. Did you ever see such a perfect place for lawlessness? And anything might happen here now with the same certainty of impunity, continued Duchesne, lighting his pipe, the snap of the match making us all start. Dardesh, your lamented relative, was certainly well fixed. She had full scope here for her traditional experiments in demonology. "'Curse me if I don't believe that those same traditions were more or less founded on fact,' said Eugene. "'I never saw this court under these conditions before, but I could believe anything now. What's that?' "'Nothing but a door slamming,' said Duchesne, loudly. "'Well, I wish doors wouldn't slam in houses that have been empty eleven months.' "'It is irritating, and Duchesne slipped his arm through mine. But we must take things as they come.' Remember, we have to deal not only with the spectral lumber left here by your scarlet aunt, but as well with the supererogatory curse of that hellcat Torrevieja. 
Come on, let's get inside before the hour arrives for the sheeted dead to squeak and gibber in these lonely halls. Light your pipes, your tobacco is a sure protection against your horse and dead bodies. Light up and move on. We opened the hall door and entered a vaulted stone vestibule, full of dust and cobwebby. There is nothing on this floor, said Eugene, except servants' rooms and offices, and I don't believe there is anything wrong with them. I never heard there was, anyway. Let's go upstairs. So far as we could see, the house was apparently perfectly uninteresting inside, all 18th century work, the facade of the main building being, with the vestibule, the only portion of the Francis I work. The place was burned during the terror, said Eugene, for my great-uncle, from whom Mademoiselle de Tartas inherited it, was a good and true royalist. He went to Spain after the revolution, and did not come back until the ascension of Charles X, when he restored the house and then died enormously old. This explains why it is all so new. The old Spanish sorcerer to whom Mademoiselle de Tartas had left her personal property had done his work thoroughly. The house was absolutely empty. Even the wardrobes and bookcases built in had been carried away. We went through room after room, finding all absolutely dismantled. Only the windows and doors with their casings, the parquet floors, and the florid Renaissance mantles remaining. I feel better, remarked Fargeau. The house may be haunted, but it don't look it, certainly. It is the most respectable place imaginable. Just you wait, replied Eugene. These are only the state apartments which my aunt seldom used, except, perhaps, on her annual Walpurgis knot. Come upstairs, and I will show you a better mise-en-scene. On this floor, the rooms fronting the court, the sleeping rooms, were quite small. They are the bad rooms all the same, said Eugene. Four of them, all just as ordinary in appearance as those below. A corridor ran behind them, connecting with the wing corridor and from this opened a door unlike any of the other doors in that it was covered with green bays, somewhat moth-eaten. Eugene selected a key from the bunch he carried, unlocked the door, and with some difficulty forced it to swing inward. It was as heavy as the door of a safe. We are now, he said, on the very threshold of hell itself. These rooms in here were my scarlet aunts unholy of unholies. I never let them with the rest of the house, but kept them as a curiosity. I only wish Torrevieja had kept out. As it was, he looted them, as he did the rest of the house, and nothing is left but the walls and ceiling and floor. They are something, however, and may suggest what the former condition must have been. Tremble and enter. The first apartment was a kind of anteroom, a cube of perhaps twenty feet each way, without windows, and with no doors except that by which we entered and another to the right. Walls, floor, and ceiling were covered with a black lacquer, brilliantly polished, that flashed the light of our lanterns in a thousand intricate reflections. It was like the inside of an enormous Japanese box, and about as empty. From this we passed to another room, and here we nearly dropped our lanterns. The room was circular, thirty feet or so in diameter, covered by a hemispherical dome. Walls and ceiling were dark blue, spotted with gold stars and reaching from floor to floor across the dome stretched a colossal figure in red lacquer of a nude woman kneeling, her legs reaching out along the floor on either side, her head touching the lintel of the door through which we had entered, her arms forming its sides, with the forearms extended and stretching along the walls until they met the long feet. The most astounding, misshapen, absolutely terrifying thing I think I ever saw from the navel hung a great white object, like the traditional rose egg of the Arabian Nights. The floor was of red lacquer, and in it was inlaid a pentagram the size of the room, made of wide strips of brass. In the center of this pentagram was a circular disk of black stone, slightly saucer-shaped, with a small outlet in the middle. The effect of this room was simply crushing, with this gigantic red figure crouched over it all, the staring eyes fixed on one no matter what his position. None of us spoke, so oppressive was the whole thing. The third room was like the first in dimensions, but instead of being black it was entirely sheathed with plates of brass, walls, ceiling, and floor, tarnished now and turning green, but still brilliant under the lantern light. In the middle stood an oblong altar of porphyry, its longer dimensions on the axis of the suite of rooms, 
and at one end, opposite the range of doors, a pedestal of black basalt. This was all. Three rooms stranger than these, even in their emptiness, it would be hard to imagine. In Egypt, in India, they would not be entirely out of place, but here in Paris, in a commonplace hotel, in the Rue Monsieur Le Prince, they were incredible. We retraced our steps, Eugene closed the iron door with its baize covering, and we went into one of the front chambers and sat down, looking at each other. "'Nice party, your aunt,' said Fargeau. "'Nice old party, with amiable tastes. I am glad we are not to spend the night in those rooms.' "'What do you suppose she did there?' inquired Duchesne. "'I know more or less about black art, but that series of rooms is too much for me.' "'My impression is,' said Dardesh that the brazen room was a kind of sanctuary containing some image or other on the basalt base, while the stone in front was really an altar. What the nature of the sacrifice might be, I don't even guess. The round room may have been used for invocations and incantations. The pentagram looks like it. Anyway, it is all just about as queer and fin de siècle as I can well imagine. Look here, it is nearly twelve. Let's dispose of ourselves if we are going to hunt this thing down. The four chambers on this floor of the old house were those said to be haunted, the wings being quite innocent, and, so far as we knew, the floors below. It was arranged that we should each occupy a room, leaving the doors open with the lights burning, and at the slightest cry or knock we were all to rush at once to the room from which the warning sound might come. There was no communication between the rooms, to be sure, but, as the doors all opened into the corridor, every sound was plainly audible. The last room fell to me and I looked it over carefully. It seemed innocent enough, a commonplace, square, rather lofty Parisian sleeping room, finished in wood painted white with a small marble mantel, a dusty floor of inlaid maple and cherry, walls hung with an ordinary French paper, apparently quite new, and two deeply embrasured windows looking out on the court. I opened the swinging sash with some trouble, and sat down in the window seat with my lantern beside me trained on the only door which gave on the corridor. The wind had gone down, and it was very still without, still and hot. The masses of luminous vapor were gathering thickly overhead, no longer urged by the gusty wind. The great masses of rank wisteria leaves, with here and there a second blossoming of purple flowers, hung dead over the window in the sluggish air. Across the roofs I could hear the sound of a belated fiacre in the streets below. I filled my pipe again and waited. For a time, the voices of the men in the other rooms were a companionship, and at first I shouted to them now and then, but my voice echoed rather unpleasantly through the long corridors, and had a suggestive way of reverberating around the left wing beside me, and coming out at a broken window at its extremity like the voice of another man. I soon gave up my attempts at conversation, and devoted myself to the task of keeping awake. It was not easy. Why did I eat that lettuce salad at Père Garceau's? I should have known better. It was making me irresistibly sleepy, and wakefulness was absolutely necessary. It was certainly gratifying to know that I could sleep, that my courage was by me to that extent, but in the interests of science I must keep awake. But almost never, it seemed, had sleep looked so desirable. Half a hundred times nearly I would doze for an instant, only to awake with a start and find my pipe gone out. Nor did the exertion of relighting it pull me together. I struck my match mechanically, and with the first puff dropped off again. It was most vexing. I got up and walked around the room. It was most annoying. My cramped position had almost put both my legs to sleep. I could hardly stand. I felt numb as though with cold. There was no longer any sound from the other rooms, nor from without. I sank down in my window seat. How dark it was growing. I turned up the lantern. That pipe again, how obstinately it kept going out, and my last match was gone. The lantern, too, was that going out? I lifted my hand to turn it up again. It felt like lead and fell beside me. Then I awoke, absolutely. I remembered the story of the haunters and the haunted. This was the horror. I tried to rise, to cry out. My body was like lead, my tongue was paralyzed. I could hardly move my eyes, and the light was going out. There was no question about that. Darker and darker yet, little by little, the pattern of the paper was swallowed up in the advancing night. 
A prickling numbness gathered in every nerve. My right arm slipped without feeling from my lap to my side, and I could not raise it. It swung, helpless. A thin, keen humming began in my head like the cicadas on a hillside in September. The darkness was coming fast. Yes, this was it. Something was subjecting me, body and mind, to slow paralysis. Physically, I was already dead. If I could only hold my mind, my consciousness, I might still be safe, but could I? Could I resist the mad horror of the silence, the deepening dark, the creeping numbness? I knew that, like the man in the ghost story, my only safety lay here. It had come at last. My body was dead, I could no longer move my eyes. They were fixed in that last look on the place where the door had been, now only a deepening of the dark. Utter night. The last flicker of the lantern was gone. I sat and waited. My mind was still keen, but how long would it last? There was a limit even to the endurance of the utter panic of fear. Then the end began. In the velvet blackness came two white eyes, milky, opalescent, small, far away. Awful eyes, like a dead dream. More beautiful than I can describe, the flakes of white flame moving from the perimeter inward, disappearing in the center, like a never-ending flow of opal water into a circular tunnel. I could not have moved my eyes had I possessed the power. They devoured the fearful, beautiful things that grew slowly, slowly larger, fixed on me, advancing, growing more beautiful, the white flakes of light sweeping more swiftly into the blazing vortices the awful fascination deepening in its insane intensity as the white, vibrating eyes grew nearer, larger. Like a hideous and implacable engine of death, the eyes of the unknown horror swelled and expanded until they were close before me. Enormous, terrible, and I felt a slow, cold, wet breath propelled with mechanical regularity against my face enveloping me in its fetid mist, in its carnal house deadliness. With ordinary fear goes always a physical terror, but with me in the presence of this unspeakable thing was only the utter and awful terror of the mind, the mad fear of a prolonged and ghostly nightmare. Again and again I tried to shriek to make some noise, but physically I was utterly dead. I could only feel myself go mad with the terror of hideous death. The eyes were close on me, their movement so swift that they seemed to be but palpitating flames. The dead breath was around me like the depths of the deepest sea. Suddenly a wet, icy mouth like that of a dead cuttlefish, shapeless, jelly-like, fell over mine. The horror began slowly to draw my life from me, but as enormous and shuddering folds of palpitating jelly swept sinuously around me, my will came back. My body awoke with the reaction of final fear, and I closed with the nameless death that enfolded me. What was it that I was fighting? My arms sunk through the unresisting mass that was turning me to ice. Moment by moment, new folds of cold jelly swept around me, crushing me with the force of titans. I fought to wrest my mouth from this awful thing that sealed it, but if ever I succeeded and caught a single breath, the wet, sucking mass closed over my face again before I could cry out. I think I fought for hours, desperately, insanely, in a silence that was more hideous than any sound. Fought until I felt final death at hand. Until the memory of all my life rushed over me like a flood. Until I no longer had strength to wrench my face from that hellish succubus. Until with a last mechanical struggle I fell and yielded to death. Then I heard a voice say, if he is dead, I can never forgive myself. I was to blame. Another replied, he is not dead. I know we can save him if only we reach the hospital in time. Drive like hell, coacher. Twenty francs for you if you get there in three minutes. Then there was night again and nothingness, until I suddenly awoke and started around. I lay in a hospital ward, very white and sunny. Some yellow fleur-de-lis stood beside the head of the pallet, and a tall Sister of Mercy sat by my side. To tell the story in a few words, I was in the Hotel Dieu, where the men had taken me that fearful night of the 12th of June. I asked for Fargeau or Duchesne, and by and by the latter came, and sitting beside the bed told me all that I did not know. 
It seems that they had sat each in his room hour after hour hearing nothing, very much bored and disappointed. Soon after two o'clock, Fargeau, who was in the next room, called to me to ask if I was awake. I gave no reply, and after shouting once or twice, he took his lantern and came to investigate. The door was locked on the inside. He instantly called Dardesh and Duchesne, and together they hurled themselves against the door. It resisted. Within, they could hear irregular footsteps dashing here and there with heavy breathing. Although frozen with terror, they fought to destroy the door and finally succeeded using a great slab of marble that formed the shelf of the mantel in Fargeau's room. As the door crashed in, they were suddenly hurled back against the walls of the corridor as though by an explosion. The lanterns were extinguished, and they found themselves in utter silence and darkness. As soon as they recovered from the shock, they leaped into the room and fell over my body in the middle of the floor. They lighted one of the lanterns and saw the strangest sight that can be imagined. The floor and walls to the height of about six feet were running with something that seemed like stagnant water, thick, glutinous, sickening. As for me, I was drenched with the same cursed liquid. The odor of musk was nauseating. They dragged me away, stripped off my clothing, wrapped me in their coats, and hurried to the hospital, thinking me perhaps dead. Soon after sunrise, Dardesh left the hospital, being assured that I was in a fair way to recovery with time, and with Fargeau went up to examine by daylight the traces of the adventure that was so nearly fatal. They were too late. Fire engines were coming down the street as they passed the academy. A neighbor rushed up to Dardesh. Oh, monsieur, what misfortune! Yet, what fortune! It is true, la bouche d'enfer. I beg pardon, the residence of the lamented Mademoiselle de Tartas was burned, but not wholly, only the ancient building. The wings were saved, and for that great credit is due the brave firemen. Monsieur will remember them, no doubt. It was quite true. Whether a forgotten lantern overturned in the excitement had done the work, or whether the origin of the fire was more supernatural, it was certain that the mouth of hell was no more. A last engine was pumping slowly as Dardesh came up. Half a dozen limp and one distended hose stretched through the porte cochere, and within only the façade of Francis I remained, draped still with the black stems of the wisteria. Beyond lay a great vacancy where thin smoke was rising slowly. Every floor was gone, and the strange halls of Mademoiselle Bly de Tartas were only a memory. With Dardesh I visited the place last year, but in the stead of the ancient walls was then only a new and ordinary building, fresh and respectable. Yet the wonderful stories of the old Bouche d'Enfer still lingered in the quarter, and will hold there, I do not doubt, until the Day of Judgment. End of number 252, Rue Monsieur le Prince.